Hey, church family, thank you for being here. You know, one of my favorite parts of the week is getting to come together as a church family and worship Jesus. And I'm especially excited this week as we kick off this series, The Elimination of Hurry. There's a man named Dallas Willard. He was a philosopher at the University of Southern California, but he's actually better known as um, a teacher of the way of Jesus. And Willard once called hurry the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. He said followers of Jesus who was rarely, if ever, in a hurry must ruthlessly eliminate hurry. Rushing through life can affect your physical, emotional, and spiritual health, leaving you unfulfilled and unable to devote time and attention to the people and the things that you care for most. The hurried life is leaving many of us feeling emptied and actually worried. Why are so many people falling into this trap of the hurried life? Well, I believe it is because your enemy, Satan, would like nothing more than to distract you and move you from one thing to the next as quickly as he can so that you have no time to spend in the presence of God. He wants you to live a hurried life because he knows it can kill all the things that you hold most dear. Your relationship with God, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your kids. And in today's message, as we kick off this series teaching on the problem of hurry, we're going to make the case that a hurried life leads to a worried life. So how do you start the process of eliminating hurry from your life? You have to work backwards. To eliminate the hurry, you have to first start by eliminating the worry. We're going to learn how Jesus taught his followers to remove worry from their lives But before we go any further, I want to stop and pray with you that the Holy Spirit would work in your heart this morning, would speak to you more than I ever could through his words of truth. Will you pray with me? Father God, will you help us in these next few moments to be still and know that you are God. And God, as we study your words of truth, would you reveal to us more of who you are and how you want us to live as your followers. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Well, a few weeks ago, I read an article talking about how our world is becoming more stressed and anxious every year. Gallup is a large polling company, and they sought to find out the mood of the world with a global emotions report. So they surveyed 160,000 people in 116 different countries during the year 2020 and early 2021. And the results of their study showed that more people felt stressed, sad, angry, and worried in 2020, more than at any point in Gallup's global tracking. And Gallup claims that it's not solely due to the worldwide pandemic, though it is a major contributor. They said the trend of happiness has been trending downward for over a decade. Here are some highlights in their survey. They found that 4 in 10 adults said they had experienced worry or stress. Under 3 in 10 had experienced physical pain. About 1 in 4 or more experienced sadness or anger. And the poll concluded that 2020 officially became the most stressful year in recent history. 
Nearly 190 million people experienced significantly higher stress in 2020 than in years past. And in 2020, the world was a sadder, angrier, more worried, and more stressed out place than it has been at any time in the past 15 years. Now, millennials which would be the generation that Pastor Jonathan and I are in, millennials down to Generation Z, which is 2000, down to 2012, they're known to be the most stressed and depressed generations. And this latest generation coming up, so all kids born after 2012, their generation is called Generation Alpha, or nicknamed the Mini Millennials which does not give that generation much hope if something doesn't start to change. Eliminating the worry and hurry in your life begins by observing how Jesus lived. When you look at Jesus' earthly ministry, you will see that he was never worried and he was never in a hurry. He lived in the present, and he took time to meet people right where they were at. He stopped and he recognized those that the world was rushing by. So today, we're going to look at how he taught his followers to live. We're going to look at the longest sermon in the Bible that was preached by Jesus. If you have your Bibles with you, or your phone, Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, the second half of the Bible. Matthew chapter 5. If you're joining us online this morning, I want to say welcome and invite you to follow along with us. If you're taking notes, I have four main points for today. The name of this message is Four Ways to Eliminate Hurry from Your Life. And we're going to look at the first point. Jesus preached this sermon right at the beginning of his ministry. And those who were listening were his disciples and a large crowd of people that were following him. So first off, if you're taking notes, you eliminate hurry by living in the present. You eliminate hurry by living in the present. Look with me at Matthew 5, verses 1 through 2. It says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them. And we're going to stop right there. Okay, Jesus hasn't even started preaching this sermon, but there's a lot that we can see in those first few verses. Three things I want you to notice. Jesus' attitude, his location, and his body language. First, Jesus' attitude. When Jesus saw the crowds of people that were following him, he could have gone somewhere else to be alone with his disciples and teach them. But he didn't. He let the crowds of people listen in on his teaching. He lived in the present as he taught his disciples and the crowd of people God's word. But second, notice Jesus' location. Jesus taught this sermon outside, in his Father's creation. And as we move further on, we'll see that Jesus even used creation to help explain what he was teaching. Being outdoors in God's creation also helps you to live in the present. But third, his body language. Notice Jesus wasn't standing on the side of the mountain as he preached this message. It says he sat down on the side of the mountain. He firmly planted himself in the present with the people that were with him. Now, Jesus lived in the present in many different ways. If we look at his earthly ministry throughout the New Testament, you'll see that Jesus lived in the present to notice Zacchaeus, 
up in a tree when there were crowds of people around him, and he invited himself to Zacchaeus' home to share a meal with him and his friends. He lived in the present when he didn't rush the crowds of people home after listening to his teaching all day. No, he fed over 5,000 men, women, and children. He lived in the present. He also stopped to notice and heal blind Bartimaeus that the world was rushing by. As Bartimaeus called out, they were trying to shush Bartimaeus. Shh, Jesus doesn't have time for you. Be quiet. But Jesus did have time for Bartimaeus. He saw him when the world was rushing by. He also lived in the present when he was teaching in an overcrowded house. As a man was lowered through the roof, a paralyzed man on a mat, Jesus paused his teaching to heal that man. You see, living in the present helps you to see the people that God has put around you. And people are important to God. So if people are important to God, they must be important to us as his followers. Don't rush through life and miss those God has put around you. Now, it's easy to fall into the hurried life, and I admit, because the minute I'm driving up my driveway and I walk in the front door, I can see a million things that I could be getting done. Pastor Jonathan and I actually have both said, if it were not for the gift of our children, we probably would both be workaholics because we love to do things and to accomplish things and to get things done. So we praise God for our children, though they can at some times lead us to a hurried life. More often than not, God uses my children in my life to bring me to a place of calmness and stillness and remind me to live in the present when they say, Hey, Mom, will you sit and color a picture with me? Or, hey, Mom, will you come play Legos with me? Or, Mom, after dinner tonight, can we have a dance party in the living room? Or just last night, my daughter Zoe said before she went to bed, Mom, can you just sit on my bed and talk with me? But my absolute favorite is when my kids say, hey, Mom, you want to go sit on the front porch and just be together? I honestly believe that front porches are God's gift for living in the present. So if you don't have a front porch, maybe you should build one this summer. But that's beside the point. When you live a hurried life, relationships with people are what you miss out on the most, but especially your relationship with Jesus. So number one, eliminate hurry by living in the present. But number two, eliminate hurry by casting your anxiety on God. Now there are a lot of things that we worry about in our lives. We worry about getting a good enough job so we can provide for our family. We worry about putting enough money into retirement. We worry about our children or our grandchildren in this crazy world that we live in. What's going to happen in the next few years? We worry about where we're going to go on vacation. We worry about even posting just the right thing on social media so that will give us lots of likes and hearts, right? And then we worry about what people will think of us and we worry about if we're doing enough and it leads to more worry and more worry and more worry. And it's exhausting, church. It really is. We can't go on living like this. That is not how Jesus called his followers to live. Followers of Jesus don't live for the things of this world because they have eternal matters to pursue. Now, Jesus used his creation in the great outdoors to help explain why worrying is useless and actually a sin. 
So we're going to jump ahead in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6, turn with me to verse 24. It's about three quarters of the way through his message. And Jesus says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So Jesus tells his followers here, you can only serve one master. And it's up to you to make that choice. Is it going to be God? Or is it going to be wealth? Or material things? The things of this world? The choice is yours. Who is your master going to be? But then as we move on in verses 25 to 26, Jesus explains why. He says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather crops into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than they? So these next few verses, Jesus starts off with actually kind of a command to his followers. He says, do not be worried about your life. Jesus says, you don't have to worry about your physical needs when it comes to food or even clothing, what you're going to wear. Is there not more to life than food and clothes? Then he says to look around them at the birds in the sky. And I love this because remember, where is Jesus as he's giving this message? He's outside on the side of a mountain. So he's literally telling his audience, hey, look up into the sky. Look at those birds flying around. The birds don't worry, but they do work. They don't just sit in the nest and open their mouths and wait for God to drop the worms inside. No. Once they learn how to fly, they go out and they get the food that God supplies for them. So Jesus is not telling his followers here to be lazy by any means, because scripture is clear all throughout it. We are to work hard, but then we are to trust that God will always provide for our needs. Jesus reminds them, aren't you more important than the birds that fly around in the sky? And you are, because birds, animals, they're not created in the image of God, but each one of you is. You're more important than the birds. And Jesus says, I'm going to provide for your needs. As we move on into the next verses, Jesus goes on to say why worrying is useless. Pick it up with me in verse 27. He says, which of you by worrying can add a single day to his lifespan? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor, nor do they spin thread for cloth. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. Worrying adds nothing to your life. In fact, the opposite can be true. Worrying takes away from your lifespan. And Jesus also tells his followers, don't be worried about your clothes. Now, these people listening to Jesus, these Jewish listeners, would have known who he was talking about when he mentioned Solomon. Solomon was one of Israel's kings back in the Old Testament. 
and he was known to be one of the wealthiest men who ever lived during Israel's glory days. Solomon lived in great luxury. He clothed himself in some of the finest clothing in the world, and he had a lot of silver and gold. Yet Jesus tells his followers that the simple splendor of the lily's beauty far surpasses even Solomon. But the lilies do nothing to put it on. Don't think that the Lord who clothes the lilies will not provide for his own children. But recognize that his provision can often look different than what you expect. You may be expecting brand new clothes and a brand new house and a brand new car. But God's provision might mean gently used clothes or a used car, or a home that needs some remodeling. Keep in mind, Jesus never said he will give you everything you want, because we have a lot of wants. He never promises that, but he says, I will always provide what you need. In verses 20, uh, going on, pick it up with me in verse 31. Jesus tells his followers to be careful how they talk. He says, do not worry then saying, what are we going to eat? Or what are we going to drink? Or what are we going to wear for clothes? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. But your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Church, do you believe that God knows your needs? Do you believe it? He does. Now Jesus starts and ends this section of verses with the same command, do not worry. Seeking material things leads to a worried life, which then leads to a hurried life. And if you truly understand how much God loves, cares, and values you, then there is no room for worry in your life. The sinful trap of worry is self-defeating and it's useless. Worrying can actually harm you. Did you know that worry, stress, anxiety are all some of the greatest contributors to poor health and disease in our world today? Now, a verse that corresponds with this passage perfectly is 1 Peter 5, 7. And if I'm being honest, I totally struggle with worry, with stress, with anxiety at times, but I love this verse because it reminds me of what to do when I start to feel worried or anxious. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. doesn't say to cast some of your anxiety on him says to cast all your anxiety on him. So to illustrate this, I borrowed my son Jesse's fishing pole. Jesse loves to fish. He lives and breathes fishing. And this verse reminded me of a fisherman, what they do. Now, when a fisherman wants to catch a fish, they cast their line out into the water, then they wait for it to bite, And when it starts to bite, they reel the line back into themselves. To cast something, the word cast means to forcefully throw something away from you. So this verse says to cast your anxieties on God because he cares for you. So we do that. I think many of us as followers of Jesus, we cast out our line. But then we do what fishermen do, and we get it wrong. Because the minute we cast out our line to God, then we start to doubt that God can really handle all our worry and all our anxiety. So we start to reel the line back 
into ourselves. And we're right at the beginning where we started, right? I'm guilty of this. What we're really supposed to do is when it says to cast, to throw forcefully your anxiety and your worries to Jesus, then it's what you need to do is cut the line so you can't bring them back to yourself. And you lay down that fishing pole and you turn and you walk away from that worry and anxiety fully trusting that Jesus is more capable of handling your worry and anxiety than you will ever be. Church, don't reel the line back into you. We have to learn to cast it and cut it off and trust that Jesus can handle it all. Number three, you eliminate hurry by seeking first the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, Jesus tells his followers, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Does that first describe you? Are you seeking first his kingdom? Not second, not third, not fourth or fifth. Are you seeking first the kingdom of God. Where is your mind set on the kingdom of this world or on God's heavenly kingdom? Pastor Craig Grishel said, your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. So where is your mind set? We have to seek first his kingdom. Can I encourage you, seek his kingdom at home in your marriage, as you parent your children. Seek his kingdom first in your workplace, at your child's sports game. Seek his kingdom in what you watch on your phone, the TV shows, the movies that you watch, the books that you read. Are you seeking first the kingdom of God? Live for something greater in your life. Live for the spiritual things. Replace your hurry and worry with a dedicated pursuit of the kingdom of God. Second, are you seeking his righteousness and not what the world says is righteousness? Jesus is the definition of of righteousness, what the world says is righteousness and what Jesus says is righteousness are two totally different things. When you seek Jesus, everything you need will be given to you. Not your wants, but your needs. Do you realize that God already gave you everything you needed in Jesus Because the greatest need that you and I have is to be saved from the punishment of our sin that leads to death and separation from God forever in hell. And God showed you how much he loved you when he sent his only perfect son to die for you. Look with me at verse 34. (laughs) Jesus says it again. He says, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, earlier in this chapter, in Matthew 6, Jesus teaches his followers how they are to pray. That's when he teaches them the Lord's Prayer. What I find interesting is that right in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches them, to ask for only what is needed for today. He says, give us today our daily bread. Jesus didn't teach his followers to ask for tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. No, he taught them to live in the present 
Give us today what we need. So far, we learn that you eliminate hurry by living in the present, by casting your anxiety on God, by seeking first the kingdom of God, and lastly, you eliminate hurry by practicing the presence of God. You cannot live in the presence of God with a hurried soul. You can't. What you give your attention to is what you become. Now, this world teaches you to go, 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 and to do, 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 and more, more, more. But that's not the way Jesus taught his followers to live. And, you know, we have to be careful, even as a church, that we don't fall into the hurried life of trying to do more, 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 or we're going to burn out. <sighs> Sorry. This is something that Jonathan and I had to learn the hard way. When we left here, Payton City FBC, three years ago, we didn't realize how exhausted and burned out from ministry we really were. We had allowed ourselves to be stretched way too thin, and we kept going, 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 and doing, doing, doing more because it was all for Jesus. And it was. But I honestly believe that God had to uproot us for a season and put, up, put us up in Traverse City, Michigan for a few years to refresh us, to restore to us the joy of our salvation, and to rejuvenate us for the next season of ministry. When we were up at our church in Traverse City, we were asked by multiple people to join their teams of ministry, to work with the kids, with the youth, with Awana. And we actually kept saying no. Because we knew that we would burn out there too if we didn't learn to set healthy boundaries. And we knew that we had a specific area of ministry that God had called us to, and that was to lead the worship team at that church. That was our area of ministry, our focus. And almost a year ago, yeah, when the search team at FBC contacted Jonathan and I and asked us if we would come back, one of the things we told them is that if we come back here, it's not going to be the same that it was before, or we'll burn out again. And we said, you need to help hold us accountable. We can't do everything that we were doing before. And they agreed that they would. That is why Jonathan and I believe in more of a simple church model. We come together as the whole body of Christ, a church family, every Sunday, and we worship Jesus but we don't always have to have tons of programming and ministries going on constantly. We want you to be in community with your church family throughout the week, not necessarily in the church building, but in your homes, sharing a meal together, going to a sports game together, going out to eat together, praying together. Because church, we have to be careful that Church doesn't just become another part of our hurried life or something we check off the to-do list at the end of our week. And we don't actually want people serving in multiple areas of ministry just because they were asked and they feel bad saying no. It's okay to say no. I had to learn how to say no so that I could give my best yes. We want people serving where God has uniquely gifted them and where they are passionate. Now I'll tell you, you can serve Jesus in multiple ways. 
but maybe you're sacrificing being alone in his presence. And I had to learn that the hard way because up in Driver City, everything was stripped from me in regards to ministry except the worship team. And that was hard for me, but it was good for me because God was showing me precious. I don't need you to do all these things for me. I just want you. I want you to be with me. This is why we encourage you to find your area of ministry, serve in it with your whole heart, and when you're not serving, that's okay. You use that time to just be with Jesus and practice his presence. So how do you practice the presence of God? By living in the present moment of each day with him. There are many times when I've heard people say that they feel like God left them. But can I remind you, God never leaves. God never leaves. You leave him when you try to take control of your life and that leads you to a life of worry and anxiety. Turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4. It's a little further in the New Testament. This is going to be our last passage. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. These verses show us how to practice God's presence and eliminate hurry and worry from your life. They say, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We say it often in our church that we believe in the power of prayer and how important it is in the life of the church, and we do. Jesus never said that his house would be a house of great music or of great production or of great giving or of even great preaching. Are all those things good? Yes, they are good and they're useful. But nothing pushes back the kingdom of darkness like Prayer does. And Jesus said in Matthew 21, 13, my house will be called a house of prayer. Brothers and sisters, make prayer a priority in your life. Practice God's presence through prayer. This last week, we as a church started that 40-day prayer guide encouraging each other to make time every day to practice God's presence in prayer. And when you practice his presence through prayer, it reminds you to do what Philippians 4, 4 through 8 says. And I call these the purposes of prayer. They're on your notes. Because it reminds you to rejoice. Reminds you to be a gentle person, to not be anxious, to pray about everything in your life, to begin your prayers with thanksgiving, to present your quest to God, to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus, and to fill your mind with things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, commendable, and excellent because your mind is where worry and anxiety begins 
As a follower of Jesus, you must guard your mind and keep it fixed on him. Isaiah 26.3 says, You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Do you trust in your Father God? Keep your mind at peace. All your needs, physical, spiritual, and emotional, are met in Jesus. Jesus is enough. I'm going to read you some verses from Colossians 3, 1 through 4, and they sum up the message today. They say, therefore, if you have been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Church, remember why you were created in the first place. It was to bring glory to God. That's why every person was created. That's why he created Adam and Eve in the very beginning. And in the Garden of Eden, there was nothing for Adam and Eve to worry about until they decided to take control and take things into their own hands. Satan deceived them by telling them if they broke the one command God gave them, They could be like God. And that sounded pretty good to them in that moment. They gave in to that sin and deception because they wanted to be in control. And when they did, that's when sin entered the world. And along with that sin came a whole lot of worry and anxiety. The sin of worry and anxiety is part of the reason Jesus had to come down here to this earth. He died on the cross and rose again three days later to free you from that sin. Will you recognize today that you can't save yourself? You can't overcome the worry, anxiety, depression, stress in your life. You can't. You need Jesus. Do you actually realize That the command God gave to Adam and Eve, that one command, was for their protection. And this command that Jesus said in Matthew 6 over and over to his followers, do not worry, it's actually for your protection. It is. God is trying to protect you from leading a hurried, worried, stressed out life. That's why he tells you don't give in to the sin. Allowing worry and anxiety to control you does not bring glory to God. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world you will have trouble. He said it. We live in a sinful world. We're going to have trouble. But then he said, take heart because I have overcome the world. You, me, we have not overcome the world. But Jesus has. And that is why he can handle all of your worry and anxiety. Maybe you're here today and you're worried about where you'll go when you die. What's going to happen to you? That's actually something to legitimately be worried about. You should be worried about that. Because Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That verse tells you that you and I deserve death because of our sin, but God is offering a free gift of eternal life through Jesus. If you've not yet made the decision to confess your sin, to believe on Jesus' death and resurrection for you. Will you do that today? 
don't wait. Repent and turn from your sin to your Savior. And follower of Jesus, ask God today to free you from the sin struggle of a worried life that is leading to a hurried life. Right now, recognize areas of your life that you're worried about. What have you been worried, stressed, anxious about in this last week? What is it? Maybe you need to write it down right now. Recognize what it is and then repent of it. Turn from it, cast it to Jesus, and walk away believing that he is fully able to handle it. We're going to close out our service today with a new song that the worship team is going to lead us in. And this song is a message in and of itself. It tells you to come to Jesus as you are. You know, too often we want to try and clean ourselves up or fix ourselves before we come to Jesus. We want to overcome that worry, that anxiety, that stress on our own. But can I encourage you today? Jesus doesn't want you to try and fix it on your own. Because when you do that, you're not fully relying on him. And quite frankly, you can't fix it on your own. You can't. He wants you to come in the middle of your brokenness your anxiety, your worries, your fears, your depression, and he wants you to lay them at his feet. Come as you are. Repent and confess them to him today. As the worship team leads us in this song, the altar is going to be open today. And I invite you to come as you are. Don't let pride stop you from coming or what other people will think of you. Because too often, we don't want people to know that we struggle with depression or stress or anxiety. We want to fix it on our own. You can't. Come to Jesus. Lay it at his feet. Maybe you need to come to him today for the first time and confess that you know you're a sinner and you believe that he died and he rose again for you. Maybe you're already a follower of Jesus, but you've been trying to control those areas in your life and it's not working out too well for you. Brothers and sisters, come and repent of trying to carry all your worry and anxiety on your own. You can't. Meet Jesus today and surrender not part of your life, but everything in your life to Jesus. Let me pray with you. Jesus, you are all that we need. You are enough. God, we repent of the ways we have lived for ourselves and allowed worry and anxiety to control our lives. Will you please help us as your followers to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And as your Holy Spirit gives us the strength to live this way, we know that you will give us everything that we need. In Jesus' name, amen.